Hello everyone and welcome to The Dry Dock, episode 141. This week the questions are taken from guide 201 on HMS New Zealand and on the accompanying Wednesday video on the development of the naval shell. Nicholas Smurs asks, what would you have done in the defence of Port Arthur during the Russo-Japanese War? Was there ever a chance for a Russian victory? And what changes, if any, did the Russian Navy implement in reaction to the defeat at Tsushima? To a large extent, the Russian fleet in Port Arthur is living on borrowed time that's nothing really to do with their capabilities as a navy. It's to do with the fact the land war is going badly. By the end of 1904, the Japanese will establish some 11-inch howitzers in the hills around Port Arthur, and that's the end of that. So, you're on a time limit. As for whether or not there's a chance of a Russian victory, yes, there is, at least against the forces the Japanese have blockading them. But whilst there is a potentially relatively clear path to that, it kind of obviously requires a certain amount of foreknowledge because historically the Russians tried to sail out under Makarov, hit mines, lost Makarov, fell back, laid their own mines, the Japanese lost some ships, but it didn't really go much further than that for a good long while. Whereas with admittedly obviously kind of semi-abusing that foreknowledge, my strategy would be to initially stay in harbour and then establish a system of coast watchers and put out offensive mines myself first, as well as Shanghai, whatever small boats I've got in the area for mine sweeping purposes, and then when my coast watchers report that one or more of the Japanese capital ships have hit mines and have sunk or have been badly damaged, then I take my fleet out with minesweepers running ahead of me to make sure I don't run into any potential Japanese mines, at least while I'm clearing the harbour, and try and hit the Japanese fleet whilst they're still weakened from having lost a number of ships to mines. Given the ships that they had at Port Arthur and the diminished strength of the Japanese squadron at that point, there's a reasonable chance Makarov could have broken the blockade. Now the Japanese can just show up with more ships in the long term, but that would have certainly helped it's the, the local tactical victory as opposed to the strategic one. As far as changes the Russian Navy implemented in reaction to the defeat of Tsushima, quite extensive ones um the the list would be far beyond the ability of a single dried up question to ask but one of the main ones that came out of it was a fairly large emphasis on improving gunnery in all aspects both in terms of fire control and fire direction gunnery standards and also improving the quality and makeup of their shells and that did stand them in pretty good stead when it came to their capital ships in the First World War. Um, so that's why you saw things like Slava in the Battle of Moon Sound and its run-ups and the various Russian pre-dreadnoughts and, in fact, dreadnought engagement in the Black Sea as well, where their gunnery was pretty darn good. Bradley James asks, In the early to mid-20th century, were any small nations or nations with lesser navies building warships domestically, or were they always procured from more major naval powers? Well, it depends how far down the line you go with small nations. Um, for example, the Dutch built pretty much all of their warships, and they were planning, obviously, on building the 1047s themselves. They counted as a lesser navy in part because the Netherlands was overrun, and they're a relatively small nation by the time, but compared to others, the D Dutch Navy was relatively large, just not on the scale of someone like France or Germany or Italy. And then you go further down the scale still to somewhere like Norway, where Eitzvold and Norge were built overseas, but other uh, warships that they had, like the Sleipnir-class destroyers, one of which is seen here, were built domestically. The Finns built Vainamonen and Ilmarinen on their own. Um, so that's, I guess, another small navy that's building their own ships. 
so yeah, there there were quite a few what you might call smaller nations or nations with smaller navies that were building their own ships, but on a descending scale. So as we said, some someone that you might classify as pushing into the medium mid size, like the the Dutch, were building all of their own ships. The further down you go, the more and more you find the bigger ships are perhaps being built or bought from overseas and some of the smaller ships in line with that nation's uh, shipbuilding capability are being built by local shipyards. Jacob S. asks, did the Jean Bar have any chance at Casablanca? Um, technically, yes, in as much as her guns, well, half her guns worked and the 15-inch shells worked so if she'd managed to score hits on massachusetts then she could have done enough damage to drive massachusetts off in theory but practically she's a moored battleship operating with half her guns and therefore completely stationary against a mobile battleship that has all of its guns working and has an awful lot of friends including carrier aircraft so yes in on paper, there's nothing to stop Jean Bar doing some fairly serious damage if she gets the hits in early. But in all practical reasoning, it's she's doomed one way or the other. She is going to keep, be disabled, knocked out, or sunk at her post. It's just a matter of time and how quickly that happens. Truly Canadian asks a two-part question. He said, first, a while back in the dry dock, you said Russian guns were very accurate compared to other countries during World War II. Could you explain how they managed this? And secondly, again, in previous dry dock, you said the Royal Navy had a way to jam a Fritz X bomb. Aren't they wire guided? How would you jam it? So with the Russian gun accuracy issue, that was, I believe, actually for World War I, specifically talking about the Russian 12-inch gun, which was a extremely high velocity extremely highly accurate weapon specifically when we talk about russian 12 inch guns because i understand there are quite a few of them the long barrel ones they fitted to the gangots they were an exceptionally good weapon that goes very much underappreciated especially for their time um, as far as how they managed it they just got that basically without going into extreme details on how to manufacture a naval gun which will be obviously the subject of a Wednesday video at some point they just managed to get it right um, in a way that you occasionally see the stars aligning for other guns um, you, for example the British 15 inch 42 the Nelson 16 inch following and was it was all right but it wasn't world beating the 13.5 inch before it again decent gun not absolutely world beating 15 inch 42 fantastic same with the russian stuff the 12 inch guns that came before on their pre-dreadnoughts again they were okay um trending towards good but nothing particularly to write home about then they make this gun and it's fantastic and then well we don't really know how larger guns would have worked because the borodino glass battle cruisers and obviously had, would have had 14 inch guns and the Svetsky Soyuzes would have had 16-inch guns, but since neither of those ships actually went to sea, we don't know how their guns would have performed in a seaway. As far as jamming the Fritz X, no, the Fritz X was not wire-guided. It was radio-guided, and therefore it could be jammed on its various command frequencies or by just blanket jamming the entire spectrum band that the receiver was operating on. So, yeah, that that's how you jam a Fritz X. There were some wire-guided weapons during World War II, certainly, but the, the Fritz X was not one of them. Chili Lynx asks a number of questions. Primarily, were there any attempts to build ships from a different wood other than oak in the Age of Sail? Uh, separately, what was the last time a battleship or battle cruiser used its guns in anger? And which modern movies would you recommend for their depiction of Navy life on a ship in the Age of Sail? As far as modern movies depicting Navy life on a ship of the line in the Age of Sail, you're really stuck when it comes to modern ones. You mentioned Master and Commander, that's pretty much the best one, by, by a long way, and it's a good film as well. Weirdly enough, some elements of the Pirates of the Caribbean series, especially some of the earlier films, 
are probably your next best go-to for what's it like being on a ship in the Age of Sail. Beyond that, you're down into TV series and much older movies. There really, yeah, there really isn't that much in terms of Age of Sail stuff for the modern era, which is a real shame because there's loads of really good stories in the Age of Sail that you could tell. I, I really, really want someone to do a, a modern Battle of Trafalgar with all the modern CGI and everything, as well as a lot of um, sort of work aboard ship as well. That would be really good. Anyway, uh, when was the last time a battleship or battle cruiser used its guns in Angers? It's going to be the Gulf War. Um, simply because at that point the Iowas are the only ones left floating and they use their guns in anger. Now as far as attempts of building ships of a different wood other than oak, yes, this did happen quite a bit actually. Uh, Santissima Trinidad, for example, made of mahogany. And great pity that she found it after the Battle of Trafalgar. Can you imagine how many cabinets that could have been made out of her? Then you've also got a lot of rushed ships, green made of green wood and such um ships made in places like the great lakes for example not always made of oak um the royal navy threw together a ton of fairly large frigates in the latter part of the war of 1812 um mostly made of softwoods like pine i didn't expect them to last very long because one the softwood and two they were um you know uh, made of green wood, green softwood, not not a good combination for long life, and indeed most of them did not last very long, but they were effectively wartime emergency builds. So whilst oak, or in the US's case, um, things like white oak and live oak, are generally the preferred building materials for most uh, ships of the line in the Age of Sail, you don't necessarily have to use them. It's uh, just a case of, well, what materials do you have to hand? And ideally, you want it to be fairly dense, fairly strong. But if you have to go with other things, I mean, in India, for example, quite a lot of ships were made of teak. And teak actually survived for quite a long time as a wood building material. It was used a lot in the backing of armour for ironclads and even as far into uh, history as World War One, Some ships were built with teak backing on their armour to reduce splinters. Anglo-Norse asks, It's well known that British shells at Jutland were largely bursting on impact or shortly thereafter. Is there enough information to say what damage could have been caused to the high seas fleet if, for example, the later improved Green Boy shells had been available? Some information. I mean, you could make calculations. Various Royal Navy officers at the time estimated the Germans might have lost half a dozen capital ships if they'd had properly working shells available to them. Um, those estimations made towards the end of World War One and the very end of the 1910s. And to a certain extent, you can't predict exactly because if you have shells that are working properly and end up doing a lot more damage and therefore possibly end up crippling or sinking ships, that's going to change how things pan out during the battle because, let's say, a significant number of the first scouting group are crippled or destroyed during the initial phases of the battle, so they're not there for Sheer to throw into the face of the Grand Fleet during the what would become the death ride of the battle cruisers, That in turn means his own ships get hit more and possibly will already have been suffering losses or crippling damage from the first engagement with the Grand Fleet and therefore that might lead to even more losses and this is a kind of extremely heavily thought out process that some of the British estimates followed, not necessarily all but some. Um, but without going into that in extreme detail and effectively wargaming it out, which is always going to lead to multiple different outcomes of all sorts, because, you know, random randomness is a factor in all of this. Perhaps the, the easiest shorthand way to set a baseline minimum is to look at the German ships that were historically hit and try and work out at least roughly speaking, if any of those hits would have been a lot worse had they been, you know, fully penetrating and then exploding. So going through those ships, Schleswig-Holstein, there's that thing again, um, that takes a single heavy calibre hit to port that explodes against the inner casement armour. 
So that's not a killing shot per se, but if it had had more penetration, it might have penetrated through that casement armor, detonating in the port side secondary battery galleries. That in turn might have set off a fairly major fire, which may or may not have then resulted in the ship exploding somewhat like Pamirn. That's a bit of a stretch, I think, but certainly you could have had a lot worse. You could have had, let's say, a major casement gallery fire, which would have crippled the ship. Helgeland was struck on her forward belt armor in a thinner section, so not abreast of a magazine or anything. That shell detonated near enough on impact. It did cause some water to enter. If that had been a fully functioning shell, and that appears to have been a 15-inch, then potentially it could have blasted a much larger hole and a much deeper hole in the bow of the ship. That, in turn, could have caused Helgeland to slow down quite significantly. And then Helgeland might either have then been picked off as a straggler in the night by British destroyers or otherwise caught. So, again, not a direct kill, but certainly a possibility of it being later caught, found and mobbed. So a potential loss there. Von der Tan almost certainly would have been lost. Um, one of the initial hits that it took dislodged bits of armor, temporarily jammed the steering gear, caused a ton of flooding, um, and the Germans considered it very lucky that the steering gear didn't completely go because then she would have circled back into the guns of 5th Battle Squadron. If that shell had actually worked, it probably would have penetrated through the belt armor and exploded close to the steering gear, probably completely demolishing it. That would have left von der Tan out of control. Regardless of anything else that she took later on, that would have been curtains for her, because without steering control, she would have drifted back into the guns of 5th Battle Squadron, and if they've got working Greenpoint type shells, she'd be gone. Moltke... Yeah. The hit she took pretty much probably did about as much damage as you could expect them to. Again, maybe there's a small chance of a galley, gallery fire in the secondary battery, but not a tremendous amount, so she'd probably still live. Um, Sadlitz, on the other hand, barely made it out as it was, so Sadlitz is almost certainly going to be sunk, um, given how, how many shells hit she took. There's going to be a lot more damage caused to her. Most of Deerflinger's damage is high in the ship, so apart from, again, one possible hit to the casements, which might cause some kind of fire, which might then uh, cause her to either slow down or become a more obvious target, she's not in too bad a state. She does have one hit slightly further down the hull on the main armour between the two rear turrets. That might cause some problems, and there are a few stern hits which kind of like von der Tan may cripple her steering if they work properly but generally speaking the hit locations on Deerflinger are more a case of might if the shells work properly slow her down a little bit more but I think Deerflinger's probably got a decent chance of escaping as long as her steering gear stays intact. Koenig on the other hand is definitely a ship that could have been sunk. Um, she suffered a number of hits, she suffered a fair bit of flooding and some of those hits, as you might guess from the flooding, were low enough down to uh, cause significant problems for her. If all the shells that had hit her worked properly, and therefore, you know, blowing larger holes and blowing holes deeper in the ship, then, yeah, Koenig could very well either have been sunk outright or crippled sufficiently that she had to fall behind and would then be mobbed and sunk. So Koenig's definitely on the casualty list. Grossa Kerfurst is another one you can probably chalk up to casualties. In the second round of engagement with the Grand Fleet, she took multiple hits, including one very classic malfunctioning shell that burst on her main armour belt, although it still caused a lot of flooding. Eventually, she'd have over 3,000 tonnes of water aboard. So if those shells had been functioning, again, punching through the armour, exploding inside, making damage control efforts a lot worse, letting in a lot more water... Yeah, Grosser Curvers would definitely be up there on the casualty list. Mark Graf is a little bit more questionable. She, again, took a number of hits that exploded on contact and failed to cause much damage, although even then she still took some flooding. 
so it's possible then um there was, she also took a hit that very possibly might have um taken out her casemate deck again which might have caused them to have to flood the mag the magazines for the secondary battery uh and it did cause damage that she was also in receipt of damage to a propeller shaft which slowed her down so mark graf yeah possibly mark graf as well so at that point you're looking at the germans potentially being down at least Seidlitz and von der Tann, certainly. Um, Grosser Kurfürst and Koenig, definitely. Markgraf, quite possibly, um, I would say. So factoring all things in, yeah, saying half a dozen capital ships lost as a baseline estimate, once you take into account those ones that almost certainly will be and then cumulative damage on others. Yeah, that's probably a reasonable baseline. Tom M. and Nimbus Shadow Wings ask similar questions. So Tom asks, can you expand on your theory with regards to US super heavy shells? Um, is the thinking that higher velocity but lower shell weight would have aided in armor penetration? And Nimbus Shadow Wings asking, what were the armor piercing stats on 16 inch armor piercing shells in the US Navy? And what would they have been using the method you mentioned with hilarious armor piercing values? So to explain my reasoning, yes, it's basically that the 16 inch 50 gun is, as the name suggests, a 50 caliber weapon. So it's going to be able to fire shells at a higher velocity than the 16 inch 45, even assuming you change nothing in terms of the charge, the shell, etc. Because it's got that extra five calibers worth of barrel for more burning time for the propellant. Now, historically, the 16 inch 50 used the Mark 8 super heavy shell, which was designed to drop down and penetrate deck armor however they ended up in this slightly weird paradigm where the 16 inch 45 on the north carolinas and the south dakotas if it used the mark 8 shell the muzzle velocity was such that you uh, the longer ranges could then drop perhaps deck penetrating shots and the idea of the super heavy shell was basically because it was much much heavier you'd have to fire it at a higher angle to get it to go the same distance which means its angle of descent is steeper therefore better at penetrating deck armor the problem for me with the 16 inch 50 is that because of the extra power that the 16 inch 50 gives you that super heavy mark 8 actually flies out to a distance that despite its super heavy nature it only actually starts dropping at a rate and angle where it's got decent deck penetration and therefore is able to exploit the fact that it's a super heavy shell at ranges that are beyond the realistic capability of a battleship to hit if you're talking about another moving target and i have discussed this in the past um, so many of you will be familiar with this reasoning but effectively it comes down to the fact that above a range is more than about thirty thousand yards a relatively fast moving target like say a treaty era battleship assuming standard distributions of shells in this case based on u.s post-war trials in terms of the spread assuming that your target steers by the flash of the guns i.e they're steering on a course you calculate fire solution you fire your guns as soon as your target sees your guns fire they immediately alter course to port or starboard maybe change their speed up as well that is going to 99 times out of 100 carry them outside of the circular area of probability of hits for your salvo assuming that you had the targeting solution right which effectively adds up to you're not going to hit them um the only way you are going to hit them is either if you have hilarious shell spread like say sometimes the italians did in which case there's no way you can escape that circular of probability um but at the same time it's so wide that you'd have to be very unlucky to be exactly at the point where one of those shells lands or alternatively the iowa in question misjudges the range which actually gets less and less likely with uh, radar and more advanced fire control systems but say for example you fire at a target 
and you've actually overestimated how far away the ship is so you're actually shooting too long the target sees your guns fire and turns away from you they would actually then be turning into where the shells would land and simultaneously if you underestimate the range so you fire your shells short and the target turns towards you they would be actually steering towards where your shells are going to land but assuming with radar fire control you actually have a decent idea of where the target is they can just simply evade so that's a very long way of saying the hilarious deck penetration that the 16 inch 50 could achieve at beyond 30,000 yards is really rather a pointless exercise unless you're doing shore bombardment of something like Jean Bar. at which point looking at the horizontal penetration penetration through belt armor at ranges where you're actually likely to hit a moving target the 16 inch 50 already has some quite hilarious penetration characteristics because well it's a 50 caliber 16 inch gun um, with a pretty hefty shell behind it so that's not exactly surprising but at these closer ranges i.e 30,000 yards and under and probably you're looking at the low to mid 20,000 yards and under realistically for most engagements the 16 inch 50 with the mark 8 has the disadvantage of the super heavy shell therefore flying somewhat slower than it could be and also dropping in at a slightly steeper angle than it could be and at these kind of what I would call effective battle ranges, assuming you actually hit with it, the Italian 15-inch gun, as found on the Latorios, actually has a very similar penetration profile, which gives you some idea of what you can do, even though the 15-inch shell is obviously slightly lighter, but the Italian gun fires its shell at hilarious speed. Now, we're assuming we don't change the amount of charge that's being used in the 16-inch 50 gun, just for sake of ease of calculation we're simply swapping the ap mark 8 shell for something more along the lines of the ap mark 5 the one that's found in the colorados but obviously some kind of new fancy uh, modern shell probably developed specifically for the 16 inch 50 so using conservative estimates i looked at what's the range versus speed drop off and the range versus angle change for the 16 inch 50 i looked at what's the similar drop off of uh speed and the change in angle of fall for the italian 15 inch gun and for the 16 inch 45 to give some idea of you know a slower velocity a curve for the mark 8 shell the curves look fairly similar but you can see towards the end of things that the 16 inch 50 is uh, with the mark 8 is retaining its energy better at longer ranges but unfortunately those longer ranges are the ranges beyond which it's actually practical to hit anything so having worked out a, a sort of a ratio of fall off of um, penetration fall off of angle fall off of speed etc between those three i was then able to take the kinetic energy of the mark 8 shell fired from the 16 inch 50 gun and the muzzle velocity and you can use that to work out obviously kinetic energy and then if you adjust the mass because you know, half mv squared is kinetic energy adjust the mass you know your kinetic energy figure because you're still using the same charge you can then retro calculate it back to give a new muzzle velocity so the average muzzle velocity for the 16 inch 50 with the Mark 8 is 739 meters per second. And I'm using meters per second rather than feet per second because it just makes it easier to calculate things in joules. And if you made a shell with approximately the same weight as a Mark 5 AP shell, i.e. a standard weight AP shell, we're not talking about an, a lightweight one like you might find in... Uh, Nelson and Rodney we're talking about just a standard weight one the muzzle velocity goes up to approximately something along the lines of 810 811 meters per second which is about a 10 percent increase and then once you throw that through the varying step downs across the range um, for decreasing speed and then once you also adjust for the angle because this is the other thing the angle is going to be shallower 
um, it's not going to be with that kind of initial speed. It's not going to be quite as shallow as the Italian 15-inch shell, but it is going to be shallower than the AP Mark VIII. And broadly speaking, and again, these are conservative but rough calculations, if you were to say look at the NAV website and look at the armor penetration with AP Mark VIII under the 16-inch 50 gun, you see it's all bracketed down there at 5, 10, 15, 20,000, etc. yards range. And with the adjusted angle and speed figures running through the face hard program that also you can get from NAVWEPS, which uses the USN empirical formula for armor penetration, so it's a fair comparison, considering we talk about completely hypothetical um, shell, you end up with penetration figures that, roughly speaking, are about one range bracket up. So, for example, it has listed the side armour penetration of uh, the Fit Mark VIII with, from Iowa at 15,000 yards as 23 inches. Whereas with this hypothetical fast moving lower mass but slightly shallower angle shell the penetration is actually about 25 and a half inches which is very close to the 26.16 inches of penetration at 10,000 yards with the Mark 8 except we're doing this at 15,000 yards so when you apply it across the board you have got this roughly almost 5,000 yard effective drop and whilst you might be thinking well at that point, why do I need to be worrying about penetrating 20 inches of armour at 25,000 yards? Because there isn't anything with 20 inches of armour at 25,000 yards, or at any range, really. Well, that's true. But when you look at something like, say, King George V with its 15-inch maximum thickness slab armour, or Yamato with its 16 and a bit inches of sloped armour... These figures are for perpendicular penetration, i.e. you're shooting completely broadside. If one of those ships with substantial armour turns, say, 45 degrees to you, or the angle of impact for the shell, for whatever reason, is, is 45 degrees from perpendicular, that significantly increases the apparent depth of the armour. And so whilst, let's say, a 20... A 20,000 yard shot with the existing Iowa's guns and ammunition could penetrate Yamato's belt in theory if Yamato's belt is broadside on with 20 inches of penetration once you've adjusted for the angling etc just about if Yamato is angled at 30 35 45 degrees it's probably not going to go through the main belt armor but potentially a bit of an edge case but it might using this higher velocity shot because at that, that point the penetration has gone up by about two and a half to three inches so it, it makes it considerably more lethal so that is a brief summary of my idea with the standard weight shell firing from the 16 inch 50 and yeah when you're looking at hilarious amounts of penetration you're talking about as i say about twenty thousand yards which is it, it's below where some battleship engagements start, but above where some battleship engagements are decided, so at a reasonable distance, I would say. You're looking at about 22 to 23 and a half inches of penetration, depending on the armour quality that you're going up against, which, and exactly what figures you use in the face hard program, which is quite terrifying to be perfectly honest because at that point even the most heavily armored capital ships in the world have to be fairly heavily angled to you in order for their belt armor to even stand a chance which probably is going to restrict their arcs of fire and is definitely going to restrict their freedom of maneuver basically anything that goes broadside to you at that point you can just blow straight through and broadside on you can still blow through pretty much anything all the way up to 30,000 yards where you probably aren't going to be hitting anything anyway. So, yeah, there's there's my theory. Comments, <laughs> comments, refutations, or other ideas in the comments below.
Error CRJ asks, what are your thoughts on potential names for further renowned class battlecruisers or vanguard class battleships, assuming that the names have to begin with the same syllable? Uh, opening the big book of Royal Navy names is always fun. Um, so if we were going to go with more renowned class, so R class effectively, and discounting the ones that were already in use by the R class and the renowns, there's quite a few that you could go for. I mean, pick top five. Resistance, which was going to be the eighth R class anyway. Ravager, Reaper, Relentless, and Retribution. All good names for a battlecruiser. Um... <laughs> and all genuinely used in the Royal Navy at various points. With regards to the Vanguard, if you're going to build more Vanguards, and at one point I believe they're actually looking at potentially up to a maximum of five, although that was a very theoretical thing. Um, so you built one, so you need four more. Uh, my top picks from the V names would be Vanquisher, Vengeance, Virulent, and Vigilant, although extra points if you could somehow persuade the Royal Navy to name battleships HMS Violent or HMS Vandal. Uh, both of which, again, were actual Royal Navy ship names. Um, but perhaps a l even for the Royal Navy, perhaps a fraction too on the nose, those last two. And Nimbus Shadowwings has a separate question. How do they load red hot shot? Do they shoot it by dropping the ball in like a modern mortar? Or was the ignition point high enough of, on the powder to tolerate the heated shot? because it doesn't seem wise to load a superheated cannonball into a gun that has gunpowder already inside it. Well, who here remembers this symbol from Age of Empires 2? <laughs> Nevertheless, when it comes to firing red hot shot or heated shot, the procedure for loading it in order to not blow yourself up is, one, be very, very careful um, when you're carrying it. You use a ladle or a big set of grabbers, but to avoid setting off the gunpowder in the uh, cannon before you actually want to, there are two main safety procedures. One is you double bag the charge, because one bag you might have a few grains of gunpowder leaking out. That's obviously not going to be a good thing when there's a uh, very, very hot lump of iron being shoved down there. So you double bag it to avoid any leakage of gunpowder. And secondly, a wad of some kind of heavily moistened material would be placed between the uh, gunpowder charge and the hot shot. Now, that did mean you had to fire off the gun fairly quickly after loading it because you faced one of two possibilities if you left it for a long time, one of which was the water that was obviously very quickly evaporating off of the wad might then begin to condense into the gunpowder, making it useless, or... Even worse, if the wad was particularly thin or not particularly well um, saturated or the shot was particularly hot, it might just vaporise off the water, set fire to the wad and set the gun off on its own anyway. So you're effectively delaying either a premature firing or complete failure of the gun, one of the two, if you keep a heated shot in the gun for any particular length of time. So you'd be aiming have everything ready set up you'd load you'd run the gun out you would check your aim and you would take your shot very quickly lieutenant william bush asks can you provide or point to a list of the japanese navy's circle five and circle six plans from various sources i can patch together a list of circle five ships improved taiho 801 and 802 yamato 797 improved yamato 798 799 etc and, but Circle 6 is even less well documented, possibly for B-65s, for Super Yamatos with 820-inch guns. So bearing in mind that this is the Circle 5 plan as originally envisaged, rather than the modified Circle 5 plan that was actually put into practice, and obviously Circle 6 was never really started at all. As far as I can tell, bearing in mind that most of this information is from Japanese sources and therefore translation is not... Well, translation from Japanese certainly is not one of my strong suits. The ships that were uh, seem to have been proposed for the Circle 5 plan are as follows. A modified Yamato type, so this would be the uh, successor to Shinano and then two ships of uh, the A-150 program, aka the Super Yamatos, i.e. the ones with the uh, twin 20-inch turrets instead. 
It was also planned to build three aircraft carriers, initially um, three very large aircraft carriers that would have been comparable in size to the Midways, um, probably still using armoured decks as they were evolutions of the Taiho type. That was then changed while Circle 5 was being developed to one very large carrier and two of the a more pedestrian size, comparable with an Essex in size overall. Then, in terms of cruisers, a couple of the B-65s, then five of the Agano-style light cruisers, although they would have been a modified type, and four anti-aircraft cruisers. This would have been accompanied, accompanied sorry, by two seaplane tenders, seven flying boat motherships, which are slightly different than seaplane tenders because obviously they don't carry the, the aircraft aboard, a submarine tender, two flotillas of 16 destroyers apiece, one A-type, one B-type flotilla, two A-type submarines, 12 B-type submarines, nine medium-sized submarines and nine small submarines, plus 10 training subs and three supply ships. There's also a bunch of smaller stuff, minesweepers, gunboats, mine layers, sub chasers, that kind of stuff. And then you have Circle 6, which was to a certain degree very speculative and obviously completely disappeared during the war. But, again, with caveats that this is based on a speculative work at the Japanese end and then me filtering it through, you know, being able to try and translate it. The Circle 6 program appears to have contained two more battleships, so that would have been for a total of four of the Super Yamato type. Uh, no carriers, eight heavy cruisers, seven light cruisers, uh, 17 more large destroyers and six smaller destroyers, five more subs, uh, one seaplane tender, and then a whole load of smaller ships, similar to the Circle 5 program. So this is uh, all based on documentation that was produced by the Japanese and has been apparently in circulation in, in Japan for a while. This is a document, well, I don't know if it's the document itself or possibly the people who prepared it, but the citation provided is uh, Senshi Sosho, which is apparently, effectively, I guess, the Japanese official war record. Um, since, uh, since she Sosho Navy Warfare, um, apparently published by the National Institute for Defense Studies War History Room, um, authored by a chap called Asagumo Shinbush, Shinbunsha, I think. Shinbunsha? Um, in the 60s and 70s. So... If anyone happens to speak Japanese, speak or translate Japanese, and I know there are a few out there who can and want to go into a bit more detail and maybe point out if I got any of the translation elements wrong, please go ahead and do so. But that appears to be Circle 5 and 6 in their original formats. Warren Jervie asks, What, in your view, are the top three refits of capital ships or cruisers which unintentionally, i.e. not in the intended result of the refit, such as the reduction of a ship of the line to a Razé frigate, resulted in a ship which was materially less effective than it was prior to refit? I would probably argue the Tiger-class refits, because they stripped it of two of the three twin 3-inch anti-aircraft guns in exchange for a surface-to-air missile launcher system of, should we say, somewhat questionable capability? I mean, okay, you're not going to be knocking down Soviet bombers with uh, the twin 3-inch guns, but in terms of actually defending the ship itself, I would probably argue the original configuration Tigers, if they'd just been given a bit of a radar update, probably would have been considerably better at defending themselves. And in exchange, you got a sort of large-ish flight deck with some helicopter capability, but even that was, even at the time, going to be fairly rapidly overhauled and overtaken by the availability of some of the smaller carriers like uh, Hermes or Bulwark at the time, and subsequently by the introduction of the Invincible-class aircraft carriers. So, overall, if it had been up to me, I probably would have refitted... Uh, the Tiger class cruisers not like they were but basically kept the systems they had and just improved their sensor suites etc et maybe maybe drop the 
off turret if you absolutely have to for a landing pad to allow helicopters to come on board but even then i'd possibly see if you could just fit a helicopter on a landing pad without hangar right aft um and that probably would have been a, a much more capable ship and cost less therefore would have meant it was stayed in service longer and potentially even at that point might either have been around or been able to be brought back into service fast enough for the Falklands where having a bunch of relatively speaking short range radar guided three inch automatic anti-aircraft guns would have been absolutely fantastic in San Carlos water. As Ryan has pointed out on the Battleship New Jersey channel, ironically enough the overall AA close range to medium range defense capabilities of the Iowas were also dramatically reduced back in the uh, in the refit period so yes it did have some ciws mounted aboard um, but as he points out in terms of overall fire rate of fire and the amount of shells you can put down range etc there were actually probably some significant gaps in that coverage now obviously they did have to put in new systems they had to put in harpoons and tomahawks and so forth but i think again if you'd refitted the Iowas with more advanced radar guidance systems and kept a lot of the original 40 mils etc then the ship would have had a lot stronger point defense systems and I'd also answer as a example ship of a number of ships to which this was done the refit of the US frigate USS Essex back around the time of the war of 1812 to carry only pretty much carronades now this was done on, a, on a, I say a number of various ships but the reason i use essex specifically as an example is because she rather proved the point of why this is actually a bad idea because whilst it gave her ridiculous close range firepower for her size it did mean that a ship that by any rights essex probably should have beaten in a long range gunfight or even a mid range gunfight simply because essex was larger and could carry more guns apart from anything else could in fact beat Essex simply by dint of staying outside of her carronade's effective range. Glenn Riccafrente asks, could you please talk about sailors' bell bottoms as life preservers? Which navies use them and did they actually save any lives? So the two primary navies that ended up with this kind of flare trouser style were the US and Royal Navies, although a couple of other navies did also have them at various stages of their lives. In terms of using them as life preservers, apparently the idea is that you can tie the ends up and thus with, the, I guess, I suppose the greater internal volume, if you wave them above your head, you can gather a bunch of air in them, um, bring them down onto the sea and at presto, I guess, a pair of primitive water wings for a while, um, at least until the material soaks through completely. Although I suppose at that point, if you've got enough strength left, you can just whip them back up into the air, refill them with air and, and pop them back down again. But in any case, in terms of saving lives, there are a few stories where that actually did happen um, ac across the years. Now, the thing is, specifically that particular manoeuvre saving your life is going to be relatively rare it's going to happen more often in warmer waters because unless you're badly debilitated by the circumstances that we ended up with you in the water in the first place chances are that as long as you know how to do something like say doggy paddling you will probably stay afloat long enough for someone to rescue you or for you to get hypothermia and freeze to death in most waters in the ocean um whilst obviously yes this, this kind of flotation device would help keep you afloat the simple fact of the matter is that y most seas are very very cold and therefore you as i say you're probably going to end up with hypothermia or some other similar condition fairly quickly are either during or just after the period when your normal ability to swim might have given out anyway however if you are in slightly warmer waters like say the tropics the western pacific something like that where staying afloat and staying and not, not dying of hypothermia is probably on the cards at least for a few days then that it is going to have a lot more utility and as i say there, there are various stories out there that say that yes this this did help a few people the thing you've got to remember about 
uh, ships is that when they go down, they tend to release a lot of floating debris, as well as obviously, hopefully, lifeboats and floats and such like. So the odds of you ending up in the right sea conditions where your only choice is to use your bell bottoms as a form of flotation device are relatively rare, but they do happen. Matthew Jones asks, can you tell us a bit about John Cape's escape from HMS Perseus? Yes, so Perseus was one of a, the large Parthian class of submarines, and she was transiting through the Mediterranean during World War II when she struck a mine and sank in about 170 feet of water. This posed a number of problems. Firstly, the impact of the mine, the explosion, and the subsequent flooding had killed most of the crew. There were four men left, and one of them was John Capes, who actually wasn't supposed to be there at all. Um, he was actually uh, he was a leading stoker from the Royal Navy, but he was hitching a ride to a new uh, posting, so he wasn't part of the actual crew. Anyway, so they all decided to try and escape using the newly invented Davis submerged escape apparatus and duly popped to the surface. Well, at least some of them did. But when they came to the surface, there was also a swim to an island, and whilst four men had left the sub, by the time it got to, you know, actually fetching up on the island, he was the only one who was left. He was then hidden by the people on the island from the Italians and Germans for about a year and a half before being smuggled away to safety. Now, the interesting thing about the Davis escape apparatus that he used is that it's a very early way of trying to deal with escape from a submarine at extreme depth. Because if you are in a sub and you happen to uh, be on board when it sinks and then you have to try and get out, you face a number of problems. Firstly, of course, you're down at very great depth, so the pressure may not necessarily do nice things to you, but assuming that the pressure is not going to crush you like a bug the minute you open the hatch, you're going to float towards the surface in theory, but that might take a while. Also, if you accelerate towards the surface at a fairly high speed, you're going to almost certainly get the bends. You might, at that kind of depth, also begin to run out of oxygen on the way, which is not particularly a good thing. And worst of all, perhaps, in depending on what your particular point of view is, your lungs will have air in them commensurate roughly to the pressure at the depth that you are in. As you rise, that air is going to expand, and it doesn't do particularly nice things to your body if you have air expanding inside your body. And, um, well, the problem is if you breathe it out, you might lose buoyancy. If, the, if you don't, then, well, you can imagine. But also, air dissolves in your uh, blood oxygen dissolves in your blood that's the the air all over your body is going to start expanding as well which is again bad if you can breathe normally a lot of these problems are avoided except for the bends aspect and the davis escape apparatus aimed to try and solve both of these problems plus the, you know the fact you can't see so you had a pair of little goggles you had a basic breathing apparatus that could scrub oxygen uh, scrub co2 from the air and provide you with oxygen um, for a short period of time at least and you also had a kind of reverse underwater parachute made of rubber so the idea was that you would hold this out in front of you this would slow your ascent which you might think is not what you want when you're trying to escape from a submarine but the idea is that if you if your ascent is slowed then the change in depth is more gradual you're less likely to get the bends or if you do get them it's they're going to be less severe and since you have a rebreather and goggles so you can see what's going on to a certain extent um, and you're not going to run out of air anytime soon, then the fact you're going up slower doesn't make all that much difference. Because the main problem of not going up quickly enough otherwise would be that you'd run out of air. So it, you would just sort of stand, well, stand I guess, um, with your arms out holding your little um, reverse parachute and breathing slowly. And regularly and that obviously would help to expel the expanding air from your body as you pop to the surface which he managed to pull off and there were a few quite a few cases of this kind of safety apparatus helping with submarine uh, escapees 
Matt Kidd asks, which future head of state, monarch, president, etc. had the most distinguished naval career? It depends how far you go back and um, what criteria you use, to be honest, because in more modern times you've obviously got people like um, George Bush Sr., obviously served in the US Navy, um, in several engagements, obviously ended up shot down and fetched up in a submarine at one point. You've got Prince Philip, who technically, well, he's not the monarch, but he is uh, husband to the Queen, who was obviously at Cape Cape Matapan, commanded destroyers, had a very active World War II career. The Queen's father, uh, King George the Sixth, was at Jutland when he when he was still a prince, uh, serving aboard, I believe it's HMS Colossus, in one of her turrets. So he had a fairly active navy career, and in fact, you'll find quite a number of royalty had fairly active navy careers especially in the uk but also in other countries and sometimes like with george the sixth when you they're not expected to be the one who ends up on the throne they are the ones that tend to have the longest and most uh, interesting naval careers you however when you go further and further back when lines between political royal and actual military appointments start to blur that's when you can technically make the case for the most distinguished naval career. So that's the reason why there's a portrait of James the uh, Charles II. Sorry, not James II. Um, Charles II up here, because he was head of the Royal Navy during the Second and Third Anglo-Dutch Wars, and occasionally actually in out in command of fleet. So it wasn't a ceremonial position. He was actually quite heavily involved in the running of the Navy, and before that he had... A naval career as well so actually running a fleet through multiple wars and then subsequently becoming king would make him arguably a good contender for monarch with most distinguished naval career at least from sort of the age of sail onwards back in ancient times you would have kings emperors etc who because they were expected to lead their armies, if any of that fighting involved being at sea, would quite often lead their navies as well. And if the war went on for a considerable period, they would obviously build up quite a considerable naval career, which in some ways you could possibly argue even eclipses someone like James II, because most of his naval involvement came before he was monarch. So he was a monarch with considerable naval experience, as opposed to some of those more ancient rulers who would actually lead their navies at sea whilst also simultaneously being the head of state. In the US, of course, you've also got Nixon, Kennedy and Ford, who all fought in the Second World War in the Navy. For all of the couple of weeks he was in charge of the Third Reich, Karl Dönitz obviously had a fairly extensive naval career. So yeah, I guess by distinguished means, do you mean number of battles, highest rank, um, leadership as monarch, leadership before monarch, longest service, etc. All of these things can be used. Miko Leitnan asks, how was the Italian diver operation in the wreck next to Gibraltar organised? Did they get supplies and replacements from outside, or was it just a dozen or something like that blokes living off canned food trapped together for the entirety of the mission? The whole thing was actually very well planned out. The idea was that the overall crew, because there were some also some civilian crew there from, you know, when the ship had actually been... <laughs> A legitimate civilian vessel and the idea was that they would pretend to be trying to refit and repair the ship to take it back out to sea again and therefore there would be no particular questions raised about seeing people wandering around above the deck trying to fix various mechanical objects carrying crates of supplies below and indeed receiving crates of supplies from on land obviously from Spain not from British controlled Gibraltar And so all the Italians had to do was to make sure that the particular military supplies, i.e. the uh, human manned torpedoes, I guess if you're calling them that, um, and explosives and that kind of diving gear, if they hadn't already been supplied by the submarine that put them there in the first place, were just disguised, broken down into bits and pieces and disguised as, oh yeah, this is just machine parts that we need for repairing or replacing things within the ship. Or maybe this is equipment we need to get down into a flooded part of the hull in order to patch something. And so once those supplies came through, food and stuff, they could just be sourced quite openly from the 
docks in Spain because ostensibly there was perfectly legitimate going work, work going on. The fact that some of that stuff obviously was military supplies, some of that food was going to the people who were hiding below decks, who were then obviously the Italian underwater specialists, that was the secret part. The fact that the ship was just there and there was a low level of activity going on above, above board and above water wasn't a particularly difficult one for the Italians to pull off. Hens asks, was it, in your opinion, possible for the Royal Navy to keep her place as second biggest naval power after World War II, or would it be too expensive? Not necessarily talking about politics, just capabilities and potential to bring it ba back to that level financially in a post-war establishment. Well, here's the fun fact. The Royal Navy was the world's second largest navy for a good chunk of time after the Second World War. If you stop to think about it, the Italian Navy, gone. German Navy, gone. Not that either of those ever came close to challenging the Royal Navy in terms of sheer numbers. The Japanese Navy, well and truly gone. At which point, who's left? The French Navy's rebuilding, not quite, but almost from scratch. And that leaves the Russian Navy, the Royal Navy and the US Navy. Now, obviously, the US Navy is the biggest, but the Russian Navy at the end of World War II didn't have all that much in terms of surface combat capability. It had no carriers, it technically had two old World War I era battleships, a handful of cruisers, not many destroyers had survived either. The, the bulk of the Soviet Navy immediately post-World War II was mostly submarines. And the Royal Navy had a fair few of those as well. Now, whilst the Royal Navy obviously was nowhere near the size it was during the Second World War, it was still clocking in at between 200 and 250 major surface combatants for at least a decade, maybe even pushing towards 15 to 20 years after the Second World War, even though obviously the government kept cutting and cutting and cutting. So the Royal Navy was there as the, sort of the second navy of the world. What then happened was, as the UK government cut and cut and cut and cut, and the Soviet Navy went on a building spree with things like the Sverdlov class and then getting into the early missile-equipped ships, the Soviet Navy would overtake the Royal Navy in terms of overall major combatants, both surface and subsurface, at some point in maybe the late 50s, early 60s. I don't know enough detail about Cold War navies to give you a precise date, maybe someone who does a bit more study into that can. But that's that's when that position was lost. As far as whether or not the Royal Navy could have kept up its position, i.e. be larger than the Soviet Navy? Um, no, I don't think so. It could have kept its position as second largest navy over the Soviet Navy for a bit longer, if the government wasn't persistently cutting and actually did decent replacement programs. But the sheer size of the, the Soviet Union um, as a whole would mean that outside of completely ridiculous lunatic spending, I think at some point in the probably mid to late 60s or so, again, someone who's more experienced in those kind of fleet numbers in, in the Cold War naval operating environment could maybe chime in with a more precise date. At some point along that line, um, even with a much better naval budget than historically the Royal Navy would have been overtaken by the Soviet Navy. And that concludes this week's episode of the Dry Dock. Thank you very much for listening. And just a bit of a long range heads up as the channel admin aspect of it, which is, although yes it's technically not naval strictly naval related, Tankfest this year, Tankfest 2021, has been announced. It will be in the latter part of the year, I think it's in September. So I will be there uh, for both the Saturday and the Sunday. So basically because, well, I do like tanks. I do like the Tank Museum in Bovington in Dorset in the UK. And, well, th th there isn't a, uh, you know, a, a battleship fest yet, unfortunately. So, um, yeah, I'll, I'll be there. And... Um, if you happen to be in the UK at that point, and hopefully all the, well, most of the restrictions will have been lifted, so we'll hopefully we'll be there. You can see if you can find me. 
who knows, I might even make a I managed to find a drac badge or something for those of you who managed to track me down. <laughs> anyway, see you later.